Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to be sharing kind of the stage here with Jonas, uh, who is very into observability and profiling, as the title of the presentation is, because I'm a developer and I haven't had many contact with profiling itself. How many people here is doing some profiling in production, let's say, or like for your applications? Okay, we have some folks here yeah, that understand nice. the topic. <laughs> the particular experience, my personal experience is I haven't had much experience on that space, but I'm a little bit on into observability as well. And as I did this morning, early in the morning, I ask you folks if you can scan this QR code. This is a, a survey that we created with the application development working group. So if you are a developer and you can fill this form, that will be great. If you are not a developer, if you can share this with your development teams in your company, that will be highly appreciated. Good. So what we are going to do here in this presentation is I will start with a quick introduction about building distributed cloud native resilient and observable applications. So then we can jump into the observability side of things plus the profiling side of things. I think that we need to kind of like take it step by step. So again, uh, when we talk about distributed applications, it's pretty normal that we build like applications that produce information and applications that consume applic uh, information, right? And the interaction methods between these two different uh, kind of applications can go from the synchronous side of things, like doing HTTP calls, uh, to the asynchronous side of things when you can use some sort of message broker in order to exchange information, like different interaction patterns. Now, when we build these kind of applications in the cloud native space, we tend to uh, use some techniques to add observability and resiliency into our applications. For example, adding a proxy between these applications. So then we can delegate to this proxy some responsibilities, like for example, resiliency. So if our application is not implementing any retry mechanisms or circuit breakers inside the application itself, we can delegate this to this proxy that now has this responsibility of doing that while in some way intercepting the traffic of the application, like both, both applications here in this, two, 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 this scenario. So we can do the same for observability, right? Like, so if we have proxies between applications and we intercept all the communications, we can actually start looking into what the applications are doing and get an understanding on how these applications are interacting between each other. And we have built a very simple demo of kind of like this scenario of a producer and a consumer application that I would like to show you here. Because again, we are just a demo people. We like to show demos. And basically, this consumer and producer application, producer and consumer applications are basically sending synchronous messages. We are just basically sending synchronous requests. And we get the thumbs up whenever we get a 200 back to the application. And you can see here on the consumer side that it's just actually processing the request. The same with the asynchronous thing, right? Like, and you can see some. Some of those things are failing. Some of them are working out. And basically, the act here from the producer side of things is the moment that I put my message into the message broker, I get that knack saying to the application, yes, you know, that's placed there. And then the consumer side of things can pick it up anytime later on, right? Like that's the asynchronous way of communicating. So these two patterns are extremely common in cloud native applications. And we have techniques like adding proxies here in the middle in order to simplify how we uh, implement all the resiliency side of things, but also for this presentation specifically, all the observability side of things. And that's why I wanted to introduce Dapper, because like, when you think about proxies, at least in the cloud native community, you will think a lot about like Istio or like the Envoy proxy that basically works at layer four on the networking, right? like intercepting the interactions between the services. With Dapper, we are doing something a little bit more layer seven, more application level, which is exposing APIs that applications can use to implement you know, these distributed patterns, in this case, synchronous and asynchronous communications. So Dapper is a framework. It has been mentioned before, so I will not go into explaining what it does. But what I want you to take from this uh, presentation is that if you are observing these applications with something like Dapper, you can observe the high level behaviors of these applications because you can see which APIs these applications are using exactly to do exactly what. And because again, we have exposed some APIs, you have a lot of cross uh, you know, functional concerns that are implemented behind those APIs like resiliency, observability, and security being observability, one of the main things in this application, in this uh, presentation. So with Dapper, it looks like that. And I think that I just want to highlight here uh, that the application is communicating using GravityMQ. It can be Kafka. It can be a, a managed service as well. But the important side in the producer side of things is that it's consuming certain given uh, APIs that Dapper is exposing. So you can actually get interesting information about what your applications are doing and use that to troubleshoot when things go wrong. So I wanted to show you quickly, based on the applications that uh, I was running there, 
Uh, everything here uh, is being instrumented and is sending information using open telemetry. And that's why I can come here to this dashboard. This is Elastic Cloud. And basically, we are sending all the data that is being generated by the applications and by the DAPR sidecars, the proxies that are running between the applications, uh, to see what's going on. And I think that this is where observability comes really handy, because if things go wrong, then you can actually check kind of like the entire request path, right? So if uh, the first application is calling, like the producer application is calling the consumer application, what's going on under the hood if you are adding projects like Dapper that gets in the middle between your applications for resiliency purposes? So in this case, what I wanted to show you here is that we are doing trace correlations across both applications, but also in this case, what I call like, you know, like the application infrastructure. In this case, Dapper is doing some uh, you know, request proxying, and it's been actually been shown here in these traces. So you can see the application call, like the application receives the request, then the application call the proxy, and then the proxy call the other proxy, and then the other proxy call the second application. The same for synchronous interactions, and this gives you kind of like when it's like an HTTP request that it's crossing across different applications, that's kind of like normal. But when you do uh, more like a synchronous request, it's even much more important to have kind of like the entire trace and all the correlation between what happened, right? So in this case, we can see here that the application received the async request, then it goes to the sidecar, and then it goes to the infrastructure. In this case, a message broker that is configured to run these applications. And then from the message broker, this, the consumer application is subscribing to it, and it's getting that message later on whenever the application is ready to, pro to process that message, right? So you can see the full path and you can see who is taking time to process the message and forward the message to the consumer. Again, I think that that's kind of like the observability and trace correlation, but uh, something else that I wanted to show you is that, again, because you're using a specific APIs, you can use something like a conductor that it's just a, an observability side of things from the Dapper side of things. So if you're using Dapper APIs, you can see exactly what your applications are doing. And we have been generating some uh, requests here. Let's see. At some point, it should load. Let me refresh. Yes, there you go. So you can see here, in this case, we have been sending a lot of synchronous requests and asynchronous requests. And this green uh, you know, graph here, it's basically showing that the producer application is calling the consumer application to this very specific method. And it's sending requests at this rate, like, you know, like two requests per second or something like that. And the same thing with the publishing, like the asynchronous method that is using more like a publishing event approach. And you can see here that we have a spike. And this is a different, like this is using a different protocol, in this case, gRPC, in order to communicate the application and the brokers. So kind of like different metrics for different applications. And again, because it's a proxy, we can implement like resiliency policies, as I mentioned before. We can make the application fail. So you can see here that the circuit breakers are kicking in, the retry mechanisms are kicking in. And again, you can like get a deeper understanding on where your application is failing at these higher level APIs which I think adds kind of like another layer of observability and understanding uh, that it's very helpful when things go wrong. And I did that just to introduce what Jonas is going to show now, which is basically going deeper into these applications and profiling, right? Yes. So let's jump right back to the presentation. Slideshow. There you go. So um, yeah, Mauricio already mentioned the term observability and mm -hmm. observable applications a lot. I and traces. To, yeah. And traces, yeah. of course. Yeah. And I want to take a short step back and want to explain what we actually understand as, as that. So um, one way of understanding or defining observability is to see it as the task or the art of gaining insights about the health state of your system based on the telemetry it emits. And this telemetry is also often referred to as the three pillars of observability, um, where the first one is likely a known to all application developers, logs. I would hope you all know what logs are. <laughs> so um, logs provide you a very detailed and fine-grained view of what's happening in your application. But um, yeah, this, this fine-grained nature can uh, often hinder you if you uh, trying to find a needle in the haystack, if you have like 100 services running uh, in your cluster and mm -hmm. you just have logs to identify problems or yeah, drill down into problem, problem root causes then, yeah, it, it is not a pleasure. It's difficult to correlate, right? Like, just to go from a log to actually what's going on. Yeah. Like, you true. can find the service. Or even finding the entry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, for the entry, or, yeah, for, for example, for getting alerts, then there mm -hmm. are, it's the second pillar, metrics, mm -hmm. which I guess also many of you know. So, metrics provide, like, a more high-level aggregate view on the state of the system. For example, you just have one time series for your throughput or for your CPU usage. 
And yeah, therefore metrics often act as like the entry point when you start your root cause analysis or yeah, even what triggers an alert in your observability system. And granularity-wise, something in between are traces, which Mauricio already mentioned. So traces are kind of like some special structure logs, so to say. Traces allow you to follow the flow of execution of your system performing a, a single task through all of the involved services. So you, you get this end-to-end -end mm -hmm. observability uh, Mauricio already mentioned, and that's especially useful for debugging latency issues or like for failure cases to identify where the failures come from if they have propagated through multiple services. Interesting with traces, you need to make sure that you propagate the traces and the trace context across your different components that you're using. And that's something that sounds easy, but then it really depends on the tools that you're using to see if actually that's working yeah. out of the box, right? W one thing uh, making this easy is actually the Go. introduction of open telemetry, mm -hmm. um, yeah, which was like uh, founded or yeah, came together in 2019. So before that, there have been lots of competing standards and like APIs for you to collect these various kinds of telemetry. For metrics, there uh, was like Prometheus or other APIs like Micrometer. For traces, there's Jaeger and Sipkin with their APIs. And for logs, yeah, there is, for example, ACK as a, so the Elastic Stack as a, as a solution. Mm -hmm. And OpenTelemetry um, tried to like unify those standards by providing a single API to to allow you to collect all of this telemetry through the single API and then also uh, via this fact automatically get correlation so that you, for example, can directly jump from the traces to the logs and mm -hmm. vice versa. So far, so good. As you've noticed, I've left a gap there on the slide because it wasn't 100% the truth, I said, because in 2022, a special interest group uh, in open telemetry came together to work on adding profiling data to open telemetry. Mm -hmm. So the, the plan is to introduce profiling as a new signal type to, uh, to open telemetry and to leave all the benefits you get uh, as well like for the, for the other signal types. And actually, if I'm not misremembering, uh, now this, just this year, um, yeah, profiling has officially been added uh, mm -hmm. as to the OTLP uh, protocol. So the protocol used by open telemetry to actually serialize your data and send it to your backends. And for me, that was completely news. And when I found this, I thought, okay, this is super interesting, right? Like, and also I see that like there are some Java examples. So I thought, okay, I would just look into this. But then when I started collaborating with Jonas more, I realized that, well, there's a lot of adoption of open telemetry in the cloud native space, right? But how many projects are actually doing these kind of profilings there? and how many projects can actually leverage all these tools. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's pretty big for us. So um, just to, to give some intro for, for those who are not yeah. that familiar with profiling, mm -hmm. what is profiling actually? Profiling is a way of uh, measuring or gaining insights into your application without having to do any modifications to it. You don't have to change the code. You don't even to have to start it with like an additional Java agent, for example. Yep. Instead, what a profiler usually does is so it it views the application from like operating system level and also interacts with it on that way. So for example, for CPU profiling, what the profiler does is it periodically interrupts your application and at that interruption point fetches a stack trace. So you now do this continuously for like every 50 milliseconds and then you will see some stack traces more often than others. And this way you then know that there's, that, that spot is your CPU hotspot. Of course, CPU isn't the only resource you can profile. You can basically profile uh, any resource known to the operating system this way. For example, uh, another common thing, especially for Java, is allocation profiling. Mm -hmm. So you instead capture stack traces whenever a memory allocation happens, or like every 100 memory allocation. And this way you find like your, your hotspots where most memory or the most expensive memory allocations happen. So, so far profiling has more been like a performance analysis tool which you mostly run local to like figure out problems. And one of the reasons was that most profilers are like uh, what I call in-process profiling. So you have to basically take the command line to start your application and prepend the profiler. So you actually start a profiler and then your profiler is responsible for starting your application. There are ways around this to attach but 
the, the, the end result is the same. The profiler runs within the process of your application, mm -hmm. which yeah, kind of makes it difficult and a burden if you want to deploy it across your landscape of hundreds of services. Yeah. So have or, fun doing that. Or in a remote cluster, right? Like yeah. How do you enable that in a remote True. cluster that it's running, right? Like that's a little bit hard. So fortunately, there is a recent uh, shiny tool you've likely heard about a lot, uh, which is eBPF. So eBPF, to summarize, I'm not a total eBPF expert, to be honest, but what it allows you to do is to uh, take some code and run it in the kernel. So you have like your eBPF program and it runs in the kernel with kernel permissions. This means um, we can now uh, build an eBPF pro based profiler, which just runs in the kernel and views all the processes running on the system without having uh, to modify their startup arguments or doing any modifications at all. Basically, you integrate the profiler into your operating system. Yep. So um, yeah, this, this allows you to deploy it much easier. So thinking of Kubernetes, you can just take your profiler and deploy it as a daemon set so that your profiler runs on every node. Mm -hmm. And this way you will get uh, observability, so profiling observability into all all services, all ports, uh, all nodes running on your cluster. And a good thing about this is that there is an implementation available, which is the Open Telemetry eBPF profiler. S some history about that profiler. So um, the code from it originally came from a startup called Optimize, which launched this profiler as the product. The startup was then uh, acquired by Elastic and, ele and was there available as the so-called universal uh, profiling uh, tool, which is also why we use uh, mm -hmm. that in the demo, because there the UI is already there for viewing the profiling data. And yeah, this exact implementation of the eBPF profiler was then donated as the open telemetry eBPF profiler. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's open source from that point. And yeah, it offers the whole system visibility I talked about. So you get visibility into all your services and not even application stacks, but for example, also you get the kernel level stacks because the profiler runs in the kernel. Mm -hmm. And yeah, to get the system wide visibility, the profiler needs to have the capability of um, unwinding stack traces of various languages because it doesn't know in advance what, what language your process was written in. So the, the profiler comes with stack unwinders for like native, where it's basically always all, almost always the same for C, C++ and Rust, Rust and Go. So like uh, stuff which compiles to machine code, but it also supports managed languages like uh, Java or Python. Mm -hmm. And of course it needs to have an extremely low overhead to run continuously in production, which is however easily possible via the eBPF tag. So let's uh, jump back into the demo, just a short recap of what mm -hmm. our deployment now looks like. So like Mauricio already mentioned, we have our producer and consumer mm -hmm. and the, the proxies running, everything instrumented with open telemetry. Mm -hmm. And now we just add the eBPF profiler there as a daemon set to also uh, get to see some profiling data. Yeah, I was really worried when he started talking about like eBPF and running this in <laughs> Kubernetes, but it was much easier than I anticipated. So let's mm -hmm. jump right into the flame graph view. Mm -hmm. Let me zoom in a little. Hope it's big enough now. So a flame graph is a, what I would say one of the best ways to view profiling data. Mm -hmm. Let me zoom out a little more. So um, what, does, what, what does this thing here show? So a flame graph is generated by um, you, you take all the profiling samples your profiler has seen, so you take all the stack traces and basically order them from seen most often on the left to least often on the right. So the x-axis is not the time like you're used to in a trace, it's like most common to least common. And correspondingly then the width of these bars um, correspond to our CPU time that, uh, yeah, that is spent in this certain function. So um, what we see here now is the profiling data of our entire demo cluster. Mm -hmm. And we can already spot, so just the information, the uh, color is like the technology or the language used uh, for that sector. So here we can see like the native JVM 
implementation stack frames going into oh, into the, the Java calls. The application stuff, yeah. Yeah, and we can already spot like that uh, our application apparently uh, there is a Java application which takes like 50% share of, of, of the overall cluster CPU yeah. usage, which would be something to look into. And yeah, we, we get whole system visibility. So we can, for example, also have a look at where does the, um, does the, the proxy, our Dapper proxy, spend its mm -hmm. time. If we zoom in here a little, we can, for example, see the time spent in our HTTP server. Mm -hmm. Let's go further on the right because this is Go. If we are lucky, uh, I can't see it here. We maybe, so if, if it would spend a lot of time, for example, in the Go garbage collector, we would see that time here as well. We can see that if we go for our Java services because there we have this high CPU usage, back, uh, high CPU usage stack trace, mm -hmm. and this is actually a bug we introduced intentionally. <laughs> so the application performs a lot of background memory allocations. And these background memory, memory allocations put some pressure on the garbage collector. So if we zoom here, in here on the right, we can see there are no green stack frames. And mm -hmm. if, we can zoom, if we zoom in, we see that um, we have lots of function names from the JVM called G1. So we basically see here what is our garbage collector. So not only we see the total CPU time mm -hmm. spent in the garbage collector, but we also see like the subtasks where the garbage collector spends its time. Mm -hmm. And with uh, correlations enabled, we can go even deeper to get more value on a per endpoint basis. So we can also have a look at, um, at stack traces, uh, at, at flame graphs for, for our endpoint. So this flame graph here now shows our sync endpoint and where it spend its, spends its time. So if we go through, I'll make it a little bigger, we see all the Java stack frame, uh, the, the spring filters and stuff. And at the bottom, we don't see our background allocations anymore, but instead we have a hotspot here for deserialization. So 90% of the CPU time for this endpoint seems to be spent uh, deserializing content in, uh, in JSON. Mm -hmm. So to not run out of time, let's get quick, quickly back to the demo because mm -hmm. uh, I now want to conclude with uh, what else you can expect in the profiling space for open telemetry. So like I said, uh, the, this profiling signal has just been introduced to OTLP and also there has just been uh, an implementation released for the open telemetry collector to be able to, to actually mm -hmm. process profiling data. But both are yet experimental, so you can expect breaking changes when using those. So next steps are the path to stabilization on there. And in addition, I've showed like this uh, trace level correlation, which needs some additional work. This is also not yet part of the open telemetry standard, but was like uh, yep. of the universal profiling product. But we are also planning on getting that through the standardization process to move it into mm -hmm. the open telemetry standard. And in addition, uh, the profiling teams are also very keen on adding additional profiling types to, to the open telemetry eBPF profiler. So not just CPU profiling, but for example, uh, IO profiling. So where the network is yep. time is spent and page forwards. Yeah. So again, like for this community, I think that it's extremely important to understand that now you will be able to do profiling across like all the projects that you're using and deploying in your clusters just to identify where the bottlenecks are, because sometimes your applications are running right, but you're finding an edge case is one of these tools. In those situations, are, it's pretty hard to figure out what's going on. With these tools, I think that we're just going yeah. faster Hopefully. into the <laughs> right direction. So once again, the QR code for the application working group uh, survey, if you can fill it out or share it with your teams, I will highly appreciate that. And I think that's Yeah, that's it. On the second. Thank you for, for <laughs> listening to our talk. On the second. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys.